In 1936, Chiang Kai-shek was arrested by Jiang Zhui-liang and forced to make peace with the communists. Jiang did this to make sure that the country was united against the Japanese, who by this point had already taken over Manchuria and set up a puppet government in Inner Mongolia. Chiang reluctantly agreed, but he was still vehemently anti-communist. In fact, there had been a growing number of fascists within his KMT party called the Blue Shirts. They had some success in pushing for reforms, notably the New Life Movement. This could maybe be compared to Mao's later Cultural Revolution, which looked to completely revolutionise Chinese society. This movement promoted qualities like orderliness, cleanliness, simplicity and precision. And they said that people should refrain from eating loudly, spitting, urinating and even sneezing in public. But to enforce the policies, the Blue Shirts began to attack people in the streets and, generally, turned people away from their ideas. Even Chang began to believe that he had made a mistake in aligning with the group, saying, how would I differ from the communists if I were to imitate the so-called fascists of Italy? So the New Life movement began to collapse, and so too did the Blue Shirts, who by 1937 only had a couple hundred members left. And this is when war finally came. When it did, most of the warlords of China continued their ties with the KMT, with a couple of exceptions like there was Shen Chi Kai in Xinjiang, and Long Yun of Yunnan. He claimed to join the war and would later send some troops there, but in reality, he spent a lot of the war building up his own region instead. Meanwhile, over in Japan, Fumimaro Konoe had become Prime Minister in mid-1937. However, the army, which had so far largely acted independently, had taken over many positions within the government. In the government, many were therefore pushing for war, while just outside Beijing, Japanese troops began to clash with the Chinese. These troops had been allowed to remain there ever since the Boxer Rebellion, controlling the route to Tianjin. Well, on July 7th, the soldiers conducted exercises around Wanping, just outside of Beijing. The two groups fired at one another, and a Japanese soldier went missing. The Japanese demanded that they should be allowed to search the town for the soldier, but this was denied. So the next day, the Japanese mobilized their men and attacked. The missing soldier by this point had already been found, and he allegedly just got lost going to the toilet at night. But the Japanese still attacked, crossing the Marco Polo Bridge to attack Wan Ping. The Chinese, suffering heavy losses, agreed to apologise and remove their army from the town. During the ceasefire though, both sides continued to move troops to the region. So fighting erupted again, this time south of the city in late July. Another ultimatum was sent, demanding that the Chinese withdraw to the west of the Yongding River, but this was rejected, so the Japanese struck at Beijing itself. There was some hope for the Chinese early on, as collaborators in the East Herpei Army mutinied on the 29th. This however drummed up further anti-Chinese sentiment in Japan, and that same day, their navy attacked Tianjin. The following day, the leader of the Chinese forces, Song Jiayuan, was ordered to retreat and the Japanese were able to take over the city by the end of the month. But over in Japan, Prime Minister Konoe decided to open negotiations with Chiang, saying, Japan wants Chinese cooperation, not Chinese land. However, on August 9th, a Japanese officer was shot in Shanghai. The great powers stepped in to try to negotiate a peace, but the Japanese demanded Chinese troops leave the city. So talks once again broke down, and the Battle of Shanghai began a couple days later. This, however, was not such a quick victory for the Japanese, and the battle descended into house-to-house -house fighting. Meanwhile, in the north, 200,000 Japanese troops advanced onto Taiyuan, and their Mongolian allies moved west onto Jahar. The ruler of Shanxi, Yan Shi San, called on the communists for help. But the 8th Root Army largely avoided direct confrontation and launched guerrilla attacks instead. Yan's forces, meanwhile, did put up fierce resistance, like at the battles of Qingko and eventually Taiyuan in October, where they killed over 50,000 Japanese soldiers. But Yan lost over 200,000 men defending his region. This was the majority of his forces, and he was forced to retreat. In fact, as the Japanese did try to mop up the communist guerrillas, they offered peace to Yan if he broke from Chiang Kai-shek, however, he refused. In Shanghai, the battle continued. German advisors like von Falkenhausen advised Chiang that the city must be held at all cost, and Chiang agreed. Chiang believed that he would be more likely to receive foreign support if he could demonstrate his army stood a chance of winning the war. Then in September, they appealed to the League of Nations, 
but the League, like elsewhere, did very little. There was also the Nine Power Conference which met in November to discuss possible actions, but once again, nothing came from it. Plus, holding onto the city for so long caused immense problems. Constant bombings forced nearly a million civilians to seek refuge in the small foreign concessions, and Chang had sent in his German trained divisions. There were only around 80,000 or so of these troops, and around 60% of them were lost. Plus, their small armoured groups were all but wiped out, and nearly half of the officers trained at the Wampoa Academy were killed. This obviously weakened the larger Chinese resistance, and all the pre-war modernisation efforts had come to nothing. But also, there was another problem, as Chang would now have to rely on warlords to provide soldiers and officers. Shanghai then eventually fell in late November. But it did require 300,000 Japanese troops to take it, and somewhere between 20 and 50,000 of these troops were lost. The Chinese obviously suffered more in these initial battles, and particularly in the north, soldiers were sent to the front with antiquated weapons including swords but these were still substantial losses for the much smaller Japanese army. After the Battle of Shanghai was concluded, the Japanese marched on Nanking. An old enemy of Chiang Kai-shek, Tang Shengzi, stepped in to lead the defence of the city. But the defences quickly crumbled, and the city fell in mid-December. What followed was one of the most infamous episodes of the war, the Rape of Nanking. However, there was some precedent to this. Like in Shanghai, one Japanese soldier recounted, we'd take all the men behind the houses and kill them with bayonets and knives. Then we'd lock up the women and children in a single house and rape them at night. Then, before we left in the morning, we'd kill all the women and children, and to top it off, we'd set fire to the houses. This killing continued all the way to Nanking, when Prince Asaka was placed in control of the army. Around 300,000 Chinese were encircled in the city, and there was a possibility to discuss their surrender, but Prince Asaka ordered that they should kill all the captives. So, after the Japanese entered the city, the population suffered from all sorts of horrors. They buried people alive, bayoneted children, raped tens of thousands of women, and they even forced family members to rape one another. Japanese newspapers even reported on a contest between officers to kill, although most likely just behead, Chinese soldiers with their swords. The number of people killed throughout December and into January was around 200,000. Many in Japan were actually outraged by this event, not so much because of the horrors, but rather repetition of this would risk antagonising the Chinese further. So to try and stop this from happening again, they decided to create comfort stations for the soldiers. However, this would involve shipping hundreds of thousands of women from Korea, Manchukuo and Taiwan to fill them up and later they would forcibly take women from Indochina, Malaysia and the rest of their occupied territories to service the Japanese army. Yet, as all this was going on, there were some prospects for an early peace mediated by the Germans, who still at this point had close ties to both countries. Oskar Trautmann, the Nazi ambassador, handed a list of demands to the Chinese, including autonomy for Inner Mongolia, demilitarization of Shanghai, and cooperation between the two countries to combat communism. Chiang had accepted this back when the Battle of Shanghai was still ongoing, but Japanese hardliners changed their demands once the battle had been won, and now they demanded recognition of Manchukuo and war reparations. This demonstrates that in Tokyo at least, the Prime Minister was not so keen on expanding the war and conquering all of China. He, after all, like many others, still saw the Soviet Union as their greatest threat. So deploying more troops south would risk an invasion of Manchuria, plus the army had for a long time pushed for a strike against the Soviets, seizing resources in the east of their country and eliminating the threat once and for all. But Tokyo had all but lost control of their army, and their next target was Suzhou, which, if they took it, would unite their conquests. Then Shangdong quickly fell as Han Fuju retreated to preserve his own units demonstrating again the warlords of China were not exactly cooperating. But at Taiya Zhuang, just outside of the city of Suzhou, the Japanese were actually defeated in early April. The Chinese here were led by Li Zhongren and Bai Chongxi, and they deployed a number of suicide bombers to strike at the Japanese armoured units. This was the first great victory that the Chinese achieved, and it did a great deal to boost morale, and they also killed somewhere between 10 and 20,000 Japanese soldiers. Yet, the Japanese just continued advancing though. 
hoping to completely encircle the Chinese. During these maneuvers, the Chinese were able to achieve yet another success, encircling 7,000 Japanese troops in Langfeng County in May. But to avoid complete encirclement, Chang ordered his units retreat and prepared to defend Wuhan. This had been turned into the new capital ever since the fall of Nanking. So when Kaifeng fell to the Japanese, Chang turned to drastic actions to defend the city. He decided to break the dikes of the Yellow River and cause huge floods. This did slow down the Japanese advance somewhat, but it also caused huge damage to the surrounding region. Although the numbers are again disputed, it is believed around 500,000 people died, or some people say up to 900,000 people died. 3 million people also became refugees, diseases spread, and the survivors were left without homes. Chang, realizing the unpopularity of such an action, tried to blame the Japanese for the floods. But really, many people began to turn against the KMT. This therefore proved to be a great propaganda victory for the communists, who turned people's anger against both the KMT and the Japanese. Yet it should be said that this flood, which occurred in June, did stop the Japanese from advancing from the north, pushing their whole advance south. And it did kill thousands of Japanese soldiers as well, but how many, it's really hard to tell. Also, the war had been going on for a year at this point, and the Japanese had lost tens of thousands of men, and their lines were already overstretched. After all, they were now having to move further into Chinese territory, while trying to wipe out the communist guerrilla forces behind the front. To try and help out with this, a couple new puppet states were created. Like in Shanghai, they created the Great Wei government. But this was absorbed into the reformed government of China, which was put under the control of Liang Hongzi. He had been part of the old Anhui clique, and was with its old leader Duan when he died in the Japanese concession of Shanghai in 1936. So these old warlords still existed, and they were still reluctant to join the KMT. So due to previous conflicts and the possibility of restoring power, they joined in with the Japanese. This was also true with Japan's other puppet state, the Provisional Government of China. Here Ji Shi Yuan joined the government, and he was a member of the old Ji Li clique in previous decades. The Japanese actually hoped to put a more prominent leader in power of this state, like Kao Kun or Wu Pei Fu, but they either rejected to join or just made too many demands. Instead, Wang Kemin was made the new head of the government, and he was just a banker in Beijing. Then there were of course the other puppet states as well. Prince Dei and his Mongolian state continued to build up their army, while in Manchukuo, Pu Yi was almost left out of politics entirely. He in fact showed signs of sadism with page boys and young women in his court. For instance, when one page boy fled to escape his advances, he had him flogged to death, but then flogged those responsible for killing him as well. And even though he rarely left his palace, outside he was declared a god of sorts, and school children would have to pray to his portrait. This, the Japanese believed, would encourage more collaborators to sacrifice themselves on behalf of a god emperor. And his state of Manchukuo did grow during this time. This was thanks in part to a large number of workers brought into the region. Potentially millions of Chinese were essentially enslaved and forced to work in the growing industries of the region. And thus, Manchukuo started to become possibly the richest Chinese province. These slaves, by the way, would also be used in experiments at the notorious Unit 731. Japanese rule of Manchukuo also spelt disaster for many of the ethnic minorities as well, like the Oregon and Hertzen, who were also subject to experiments, random acts of cruelty, mobilization and the likes. So by the end of the war, around 90% of these populations had been killed. But back in China, Chiang Kai-shek did manage to expand his influence somewhat. Liu Xuang had died in 1938, and he had been the leader of Sichuan for years, and had taken part in the battles of Shanghai and Nanking. But it has been suspected that he was poisoned by Chang because of rumours he was about to align with Han Fu Zhu against him. His death allowed Chang to all but take over Sichuan for himself, without any intervention from warlords. Mao meanwhile remained in Yan'an. His new armies, the 8th Root Army and the new 4th Army, while conducting some guerrilla attacks, spent a great deal of time recruiting new members into the Communist Party. Elsewhere, Ma Bufang still ruled in the West. 
and he continued to launch campaigns against the Ungoloc Tibetans, destroying their monasteries and all but wiping out their influence from his territories. And in the far west, the Soviets had finally moved into Xinjiang. There, back in the mid-1930s, the Uyghurs tried to create their own country, while the ruler of the province, Shen Chi Kai, fought against the KMT. The Russians backed Shen Chi Kai in this fight, and then they pressured him to purge other leaders in the region, including Mahmud Mahuti. He had participated in the last rebellion, but was brought into the new government to try to secure some peace. The Soviets, however, believed he was trying to form an alliance with Japan, while Sheng began to believe he had aligned himself with Ma Hushan, a Muslim general aligned to the KMT. Again, this region was all very complicated. Before Mahuti fled to British India, he sent a letter to Ma Hushan to discuss a possible alliance. Then his departure prompted many Turkic Muslims to rebel against the Soviet-backed government. Soviet planes then bombed the rebels, and in the USSR, Stalin ordered 400 Wager students who had been sent to study there, executed without a trial. This whole invasion began back in April 1937, while the KMT were too busy preparing for the Japanese invasion. Leaders like Ma Hu Shan still expected to get support from the KMT, and he made bold claims to his followers, planning a jihad to conquer Russian Turkestan, Siberia, and even the Kremlin itself. But Stalin and Chiang Kai-shek then signed a non-aggression pact. The Soviets even began sending weapons to the Chinese as part of Operation Z, which included bombers, tanks, and anti-aircraft. However, given the lack of infrastructure, much of this had to be brought in on camels. But while the pact was being signed, the Soviets moved into Xinjiang in October. Their soldiers, supported by planes, crushed the rebellion, while the Battle of Shanghai was already underway. So Chiang Kai-shek could do nothing. And during this invasion, the influential leader, Ma Zhongying, disappeared. But reports differ on what actually happened. But reports differ on what actually happened to him. Back to the front lines though. In the summer of 1938, the Japanese finally moved on Wuhan. Although outnumbered by about 4 to 1, the Japanese were able to almost encircle the city. Then they used chemical weapons on the defenders, so the city was abandoned by October. The Chinese capital once again moved, this time to Chongqing. So, once again, the Japanese had failed to strike a decisive blow, knocking the Chinese out of the war. The now depleted Japanese forces paused for a few months, while in Japan, the National Mobilization Law drafted most of the people into their armies or industries. Elsewhere, though, they actually made some advances. Like back in May, their troops landed in Fuzhou, Xiamen, and Shantou. This was aimed at targeting supplies arriving in China and bolstering their armies. Then that October, they struck at Guangzhou and entered the city almost unopposed, as the Chinese were able to set large sections of the city ablaze before retreating. The Japanese next moved on to Hainan Island in February 1939. But really, all of this success did little to stop supplies coming in, as they still arrived via Indochina, India, and Russia overland. On the main front, Japanese reinforcements began to arrive in early 1939, and with these they were able to seize Nanchang that May. But to the north they failed to take over Suzhou around the same time. Importantly though, the Chinese were able to take back some land, and lost a very similar amount of men to the Japanese during these battles, around 20,000 or so, showing that the tide of war had actually turned just two years in. The Japanese were having even worse luck far in the north, they had lost the Battle of Kalkengol with Russia, and although this was just a border skirmish, it changed quite a lot. For starters, it, along with the failures in China, demonstrated the Japanese army would be unable to carry out their northern strike into Russia. This was made even worse when Germany and Russia signed the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact in August 1939. This meant that the Soviets could, in theory, prepare for a strike on Japanese territories. So to try and end the war in China, the Japanese assaulted Changsha in September. This, however, ended in failure, and the Japanese would never be able to capture the city during the war. So they once again turned to cutting off supplies arriving in China, and in November 1939, they landed in South Guangxi. Their advance further inland was halted, but this campaign left the only routes into China overland. With all of these Japanese failures, the Chinese began to believe that they could launch a huge counterattack across all fronts, 
reclaiming land from their now depleted enemy. Although they did attack on all fronts, their main goal was Wuhan. Yet they really didn't have the weapons to break through the Japanese lines, and this, the winter offensive, only resulted in little changes on the ground. However, it did come as a shock to the world that China was actually in a position to mount a counterattack, and sensing an opportunity to keep the Japanese occupied elsewhere, the Allied powers agreed to loan China money and send them even more weapons. Plus, later in 1940, there were other Chinese advances as well, with the Communists' 100 Regiments Offensive. The Communists by this point had already been accused of not contributing enough to the war effort, and instead just focused on expanding their own army. And in some regards, this is correct. In late 1939, they had around 90,000 soldiers, but this had grown to around 200,000 by the next year, divided, as the name suggests, into 100 regiments. So this offensive was a way to mend relations with the KMT and bolster their own image among the population. They weren't necessarily huge offensives, but more like guerrilla attacks running from August to December that year, during which they were able to kill around 20 or so thousand Japanese and collaborators, and they blew up hundreds of kilometers of railway lines, destroyed around 100 bridges, cut down over a thousand cable posts, and brought some plants and mines to a standstill temporarily. In response, the Japanese adopted scorched earth tactics, which they called the Three Alls policy, hoping to root out the communists. They would kill all, burn all, and loot all within the areas that the communists operated in northern China. Yasuji Okamura was put in charge of this operation, and he put hundreds of thousands of people to work digging defensive lines. He also killed many civilians who he believed were helping the guerrillas in hiding. Again, chemical weapons were used, and random acts of violence were commonplace. So some historians believe that in these regions, up to 2.5 million people were killed, making it far worse than something like the Rape of Nanking, but often a forgotten piece of history. The Japanese also brought together their Chinese puppet states into the reorganized national government, and Wang Jingwei was made the new puppet ruler. To understand how he found his way here though, we have to go back a bit. He was originally part of the left-wing branch of the KMT and called for collaboration with Mao early on, but he began to turn away from the communists after political failures. He then voiced opposition to joining Hitler's anti-Soviet pact and also didn't want Soviet aid either. He began to see all European powers as imperialist. So while Chiang was happy to receive any aid, Wang wanted China to be able to build itself up. To this extent, he began to turn more right-wing. But, possibly more important, he wasn't optimistic about China's chances in a war with Japan. So, in 1938, he fled to French Indochina, and there he actually survived another assassination attempt as the KMT tried to silence him. After this, he flew to Shanghai, began talks with the Japanese, and became the new puppet ruler. But, he was given very real little power or support. So, to try and drum up his own support, Wang portrayed himself as the true successor to Sun Yat-sen, often playing on Sun's pan-Asian ideals. That same year, Japan also played on these ideals, with the creation of the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. Manchukuo Mengjiang and Wang Jingwei obviously joined this, but the Japanese still had plans to create other puppet states in China. For instance, around this time, Yan Zishang debated switching over allegiances. He, after all, like many had studied in Japan, and had connections in the Japanese army. Plus, he also began to despise the communists. However, nothing came of this. So, the Japanese looked elsewhere to find an ally among the Muslim generals in the West. For instance, they approached Ma Hongkui of Ningxia, but he refused. The Ma clique and many Muslims had fought to defend China ever since the Boxer Rebellion, and they were determined to continue the fight. Ma Hongkui even arrested the Mongol leader, Dari Jaya, believing that he was about to switch sides. Muslim leaders like Hu Song Shang were instrumental in drumming up support among the population. He actually told Muslims to salute the Chinese flag during morning prayers, and created his own prayer. Protect us from the evil deeds done by the violent Japanese. They have occupied our cities and killed our people. Send upon them a furious wind, cause their airplanes to fall in the wilderness, and their battleships to sink in the sea. But, had things gone differently, the route to Xinjiang would have been open, and maybe Japan could look again at helping to create the East Turkestan state. They already had agents in the region, especially around Hami, 
and in 1939, they had established contacts with Tibet as well. Jinzo Nomoto had spent years studying Mongolian, so he just pretended to be a Mongolian to travel through into Tibet. This was mainly an intelligence gathering mission rather than a diplomatic mission though, and it could have been part of a larger plan to set up ties with the Afghans. This means the Muslim generals like Ma Hongkui had essentially stopped China from being completely surrounded. And although small in comparison, the Battle of West Wei Yan in 1940 ended Japan's plans further inland. So by this point, Japan began to turn their attention elsewhere. Supplies were still arriving in China via Vietnam, but in 1940, France had fallen and Japan sent an ultimatum to the governor of Indochina, George Catro, demanding he close off the supply routes. He actually agreed to this, but the Japanese just demanded more and more, showing that they were set on invading. This invasion occurred in September 1940, when they crossed the border and occupied the entire region. For a little while, even the British agreed to close off their roads into China after the Japanese pressured them as well. But the Burma Road was later reopened. Yet with the fall of Indochina, the Japanese signed a non-aggression pact with the Soviets and began to turn away from China entirely. In 1941, there were a few offensives, but they all ended in failure. Mainly though, their country was suffering from a lack of resources and they needed oil, rubber, and a great deal more. So the government began to listen to the Navy and they adopted the Southern Strike Doctrine, attacking Dutch East Indies, Malaysia, Singapore, the Philippines, Hong Kong, Hawaii, and more. This initially gave them the resources they needed but now they were at war with the Allies. So after the Japanese failed to take Changsha a couple more times, the front in China continued in a stalemate. The Chinese on the other hand had problems of their own, as the united front between the communists and the nationalists had collapsed. Chang and the other nationalist leaders realized the problems with aligning with the communists, and to understand this, we need to go back in time a bit. Even though the Japanese had conquered the Northeast, there were still some small holdouts, like just outside of Shanghai. This was held by the KMT, while the communists set up a base in Yangzhong, just nearby. The communist new 4th army back in 1940 clashed with the nationalists in Huangqiao and overran their position. This was just a small battle, but it put the communists in the best position to recruit people in one of the most populous parts of the country. So Chang ordered that the communists should retreat north of the Yangtze River. This however was ignored. So Chang ambushed the new 4th Army in the town of Maolin in 1941. Many of the reports disagree over why the demand was ignored and even who fired the first shots, but this was essentially the end of the United Front. The communists quickly rebuilt the new 4th Army and began to recruit even more people into their ranks, working behind enemy lines, often portraying Chang and the KMT as treasonous for fighting their fellow Chinese during the war. Civil war was largely avoided though, thanks to the USSR and the USA, who stepped in to dissuade both sides. Yet for Mao, save in his base in Yan'an, still had problems of his own. For starters, there were still other prominent leaders who could challenge his power, and many of these were preferred by the Soviet Union, like Wang Ming or other Russian-trained communists. Plus, the Communist Party had spread across northern China. This left thousands of people outside of his central control, and they could become a threat so he launched the Yan'an rectification movement. In short, he advocated thought reform in schools to gain an army of young and loyal followers. Alongside this, struggle sessions were introduced. This was when party members would accuse others of being anti-revolutionaries, liberals, nationalist spies and the likes. Plus, by having such a loyal group of followers following the party line, Mao could completely decentralize his control, leaving his loyal supporters to keep the other party members in check. This was completely different to Stalin's approach in the USSR, as he relied on the KGB and the likes. Mao also deviated from the Soviet Union in ideology as well. For instance, he long favoured peasantry over city workers as a base for support. But in 1942, the idea of Mao Zedong thought began to appear in newspapers, or in other words, Maoism was born. One man who was crucial to Mao's success was Kang Sheng. He had trained in Russia and returned with one tactic which he used as the head of Mao's early secret police. This was the use of torture to gain confessions, which usually included an accusation against other party members. So although they didn't follow Soviet philosophy exactly, they did use their tactics. 
and it should be said that the communists did not take so many casualties in comparison to the KMT. Even Zhou Enlai admitted in his report to Stalin in 1940, saying only 3% of the total casualties were communists. So Mao was buying time, and using the war to bolster his own position. Some historians like Endo Hamare even point out that Mao, through spies like Pan Hanyan, had some connections to the Japanese. He allegedly proposed truces with their puppet governments, and planned on stretching out the war for as long as possible. This could be somewhat backed up by Mao's future actions when he thanked the Japanese for the war itself. Like in 1956, he said, You are also our gentlemen, and we want to thank you. It is really you who have fought this war, educated the Chinese people, and united the scattered Chinese people, so we should be grateful to you. But going back to the front, the Japanese made plans to move into Sichuan in 1942, but this never happened, as Japan by this point had just become too overstretched. Yet they still heavily bombed Chongqing. These bombings began back in 1938 and continued for five years. Over 30,000 people were killed during them, and over 30,000 buildings were destroyed. To make matters worse, around Hernan, harvests failed in 1942. Much of the remaining food was being taken by the Japanese and Chinese troops that divided the region, so a famine ensued. This killed hundreds of thousands of people, and the survivors resorted to cannibalism and selling their own children. As the war slowly began to turn against Japan in the Pacific, they turned back to Southeast Asia to finally cut off Chinese supplies for good. They marched into Burma through Thailand, which had already joined the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. From here, they threatened British India and Yunnan. So many Chinese participated in the defense of Burma, but the Allied command in this area was somewhat disjointed. Joseph Stilwell, for instance, was an American who arrived in China and tried to help lead the war effort. But he believed the British were just trying to protect their colony in India, while Chiang just wanted to hoard US weapons to later fight against the communists. Plus, Chiang Kai-shek met with Indian leaders like Gandhi and expressed his support for their independence movement. So, all sides were looking out for their own interests. Nevertheless, there was an unexpected morale boost for the Chinese. As volunteer American pilots, the Flying Tigers, arrived in China after the fall of Burma. Plus, even though Burma fell, supplies still came in via the hump. This saw material airlifted from northeast India, over the Himalayas, and into Kunming. So, throughout 1943, the fighting was conducted along the borders of Burma and China. The Japanese could never break through the lines fully, though, and move up into Yunnan. So, to try and help draw the Chinese troops away from Southeast Asia, they attacked Chengde. And, although they captured the city, they soon had to withdraw. The KMT, though, were now getting somewhat overconfident. After years of little movement, they turned west to Xinjiang. Shengxi Kai still ruled there, but even back in 1942, KMT soldiers began to move to their borders. This they were able to do, because the Soviets at that point were fighting against the Nazis. While the Battle of Stalingrad was raging, Shengxi Kai tried to sever ties with the Soviets, as he himself was not really a communist. So he hoped to mend relations with the KMT, and remove the communist threat to his rule. Sheng demanded that the Soviets retreat, and he arrested Mao's younger brother, Mao Zemin, who had been in the region for years. Under torture, Mao's brother revealed that there was a communist plot to remove him from power. So, by mid-1943, the Soviets were forced to leave, and Sheng invited the KMT to fill his country. However, when the tide of war turned, Sheng tried to appeal to the Soviets once more, arresting KMT members and asking Stalin for help. Obviously, no help came so Sheng Shi Kai stepped down. But the Soviets found a new ally in the old East Turkestan rebels. Many of them had fled to Russia after their failed rebellions, and in 1944, their Ili National Army crossed the border alongside Russian troops. At the same time, a Kazakh named Osman Butur had been rebelling against the rulers of Xinjiang for a couple of years. In Altai, he was elected Khan, and the Soviets saw another possible alliance here. So the KMT sent Ma Bufang to deal with the Kazakhs and the Uyghurs who were rebelling. But again, things get complicated in Xinjiang. Not all the East Turkestan rebels supported this new rebellion. Even the old leader, Mohammed Amin Bugla, argued against the Soviet intervention. So now hundreds of thousands of Chinese troops were in Burma and Xinjiang. While on the main front, spies revealed that the Japanese were planning a huge counterattack. 
Chang, however, ignored this, believing the stalemate which had been in place since 1940 would continue. But he was wrong, and in April 1944, Operation Ichigo began. 500,000 Japanese soldiers attacked from the north and south, and overwhelmed the Chinese in many towns like Luoyang and Changsha. By the time the Japanese arrived in Guiling late in the year, many Chinese just retreated without fighting, their morale completely shaken. By the end of the year, 750,000 Chinese were left dead, and this defeat was so bad that Stilwell tried to get Roosevelt to send an ultimatum to Chang, demanding that he should be put in control of the Chinese army. This was of course rejected, but it showed a shift in foreigners' attitudes towards the KMT and communist parties. Many now saw the KMT as corrupt and ineffective. Brooks Atkinson, for instance, wrote, The KMT was an anti-democratic regime that is more concerned with maintaining its political supremacy than in driving the Japanese out of China. He would actually visit Yan'an and wrote an article titled Yan'an, a Chinese Wonderland City, where he described Maoism as the best system for China, as it was an agrarian or peasant democracy, or as a farm labour party. Before this, Edgar Snow wrote Red Star over China, portraying Mao as not a communist revolutionary, but rather a progressive force, favouring democracy. And in 1944, the Americans sent the Dixie Mission to Yan'an. John Service praised Mao again, comparing him to European socialists and describing him as a far less corrupt and describing him as far less corrupt as the KMT yet again. The US ambassador to China, Clarence Gauss, even said, pull the plug and let the whole Chinese government go down the drain. So as the KMT began to crumble, fortunately for them, the war was turning completely against the Japanese elsewhere. But despite this, there was still a final attempt to strike at the Chinese capital of Chongqing. In April 1945, 80,000 or so pushed into the west of Hunan. However, their attack was repulsed. As this battle was going on, Hitler committed suicide, and everybody's attention turned to Japan. On the 6th of August, the Americans dropped an atomic bomb on Nagasaki. And just three days later, Hiroshima was bombed, and the Soviets joined the war in the east and invaded Manchuria. This invasion of Manchuria had been agreed to at the Yalta Conference. In essence, the Soviets agreed to aid the Allies in the Far East in exchange for some concessions, like Port Arthur, which they had wanted for decades. So 700,000 Soviets crossed the border, or landed in North Korea. They quickly occupied most of the region, and like in Europe, looted a great deal and conducted a series of rapes. Even the Chinese communists appealed to the Soviets to stop, as they didn't discriminate between nationalities. But this was ignored. One of the worst massacres was at Gegen Miao, where both Chinese and Russians attacked Japanese settlers. During this massacre, there are reports of children being sold in markets, and even reports of necrophilia. But the Soviets were still able to capture Puyi before the war officially ended in early September. However, now in China, there would be a race between the communists and nationalists to take over the land left by the Japanese, and China would erupt again into civil war. Somewhere between 20 and 25 million people had died during the war, either through fighting, natural disasters, or famines. Plus, the economy had completely tanked. Compared to prior to the war, it now operated at 20% industrial capacity. To try and make up for the loss of revenue, Chang and the KMT just began printing money, causing hyperinflation. Currency was actually a huge problem in the immediate aftermath, because there were just too many different types. The KMT, for instance, began producing new notes, and there were all of those belonging to the old Japanese puppet states all of which helped the communists in their propaganda campaigns. 